Welcome to another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio show and podcast featuring your physician hosts, Dr. Tom McGovern and Dr. Andrew Mullally, where we and our guests discuss relevant and health-related topics from an authentically Catholic perspective. Dr. Doctor is brought to you in part by the generous underwriting of CMF Curo. Learn more at mycatholichealthcare.org and live your Catholic faith in your healthcare with CMF Curo. Today, our guest will be heard across the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network as neurosurgeon Paul Camerata returns to Dr. Doctor to discuss the brave new world of brain-computer interfaces. Yes, transhumanism is uh, our topic. And today's interview has an international twist as it took place at the 24th International Congress of the Federation of Catholic Medical Associations on September 16th across the strait from St. Peter's Square. So... Andrew, how often do you come across patients with computers implanted in their brains in your practice? You know, uh, I'd say rarely. I mean, the the first thing I, I heard about with the transhumanism, you know, it made me think of the cochlear implants, which yes. are becoming more common and, and folks probably have seen or met someone with that. But the brain is so interesting because, you know, throughout the throughout the interview, you guys talk about a lot of different things, especially the stimulators. Yes. We see the stimulators in other things routinely now. Uh, bladder stimulators uh, for people with uh, bladder and urinary problems. Sometimes we see gastroparesis, get stomach stimulators, mm -hmm. folks with diabetes. But there's something very special about the brain. It, it's hard to, to think about. It's hard to operate on. And when you look at the brain, just to imagine that we're discovering how to manipulate it. We knew there was the neurons and it all works in electricity, but how to actually affect positive outcomes by using electricity that we put in there. Uh, this is the brave new world. It's really incredible. Uh, and many of these uses sound completely ethical and legitimate. Yeah. Uh, some of the potential uses are perhaps not. And uh, Paul Camerata is an expert at parsing these. So Tom, you went you went out to Rome for this conference. Tell us about that. What What's the big deal? I mean, you go to a lot of conferences, but tell us about this one. The uh, International Federation of Catholic medical associations from around the world meets every four years. Uh, last four years ago was in Zagreb, Croatia. This time it's in Rome. We don't know where it's going to be in four years. And so we had doctors from all the continents except Antarctica there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the theme was medicine, transformative or reparative. So this transhumanism kind of idea was, was part of the conference. But on one day, they had it for the, quote, youth of the world. And youth here means medical students and young physicians. Gotcha. And that's why I was invited to speak. I oversee uh, an organ, the young members of the Catholic Medical Association who have formed a, a group within the CMA called Novus Medicus, Latin for the new physician. Ah, and, cool. And uh, so this unites all pre-med students, medical students, residents, fellows in training, and young physicians, maybe up to the age of 40. Uh, because a lot of them are finding their way in medicine and they're looking for mentors to help find how can I authentically be Catholic and a fully, you know, evidence-based physician at the same time. Because a lot of people think you either have to be one or the other. Yeah, that's right. And especially, you know, we, we we're going to talk about in other shows, some of the challenges of training, but having this focus on the young members makes sense. It's something that there's a parallel in the medical associations that are secular. Yes. Tell us about your talk. So we were asked to talk about what we have found e effective in reaching out to medical students and young physicians in the United States. And I say we, I spoke with a, a young woman I've had the honor of mentoring for the last four plus years named K Kate Kondratuk. And uh, Kate is finishing up her dermatology residency in Pennsylvania and is a former president of the student section, medical student section of the CMA, and now oversees outreach to pre-medical students. And so we went in there not only to talk about what we've done, uh, but also our own mentoring relationship and how that really works both ways. And if any of you have ever seen the way I give presentations, I use a lot of pictures and very few words on slides. And uh, I didn't induce any um, seizures in the people watching, but I think the Europeans were completely enthralled with seeing slides with pictures instead of words. <laughs> and uh, I think they loved what we've done. They loved what we said. Uh, and in fact, they were so enthralled with it, I have now been asked to help put together uh, something we hope to have a great impact around the world. Next year is World Youth Day in Lisbon, Portugal. Okay. And the weekend before that, July 29th to 31st, I'm going to be working with a group of doctors from Portugal, Brazil, Croatia, 
uh, the Netherlands, uh, in the U.S., as well as some medical students, to try to put together a weekend camp, which the Portuguese are expert at doing and have been doing for years with their own uh, young people. And our goal is to have, say, two medical students from each of 40 to 50 countries. And then oh, send them wow. back two by two and ignite in them a fire of you know, why it matters to be Catholic, what it means to be Catholic as a medical student and a physician, because the culture of life needs this. Uh, but the culture of death is fighting hard so that it doesn't happen. Yeah, well, I think they picked the right guy because I, I'm familiar with what's been going on at the CMA. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the greatest growing subset of CMA membership is even uh, the new physicians. Oh, the, the medical students by far. It's definitely the fastest growing segment. And we want to keep them engaged. And so that's what we're working on doing and developing that. In fact, we've just developed a new um, website uh, for young members to help find those people who might want to be part of the CMA, who are pre-med students, medical students, young physicians. And the website is novusmedicus.org, N-O-V-U-S-M-E-D-I-C-U-S dot O-R-G. If someone goes there, they can see three short videos that Kate, uh, Paul Day, the head of our young physicians, and I have put together, as well as three blog posts from three of our young physicians and a medical student. And then they can type in their name, uh, which will connect them to us. And if they want to, they can sign up to talk by phone or by Zoom and schedule an appointment within a week to talk to somebody and say, hey, is this CMA for me or not? And then we even have a free monthly on, on, blah, online activity that they can participate in as non-members of the CMA with CMA members to see, is this something that I might want to be part of? Man, that's really cool. I, I remember in training not too long ago, mentorship. And, and even if you didn't call it that, mentorship and companionship are really the biggest things that you want when you're going through training. Yes. And it's just because you do, it's easy to feel alone, especially if you're a person of faith in, in medicine. So Novus Medicus is the, is the place. Novusmedicus.org. And get yourself plugged in. If you're listening to this, there's people out there who, who would like to meet you. Oh, we would absolutely. So if you know somebody who's young, please write that down, novusmedicus.org, N-O-V-U-S-M-E-D-I-C-U-S dot O-R-G. We want you because it's an exciting group of bold young people who do not want to compromise any aspect of the Catholic faith in bringing the fullness of healing to their patients. That is awesome. And now it's time for the patented. Well, actually, it's not patented. Medical trivia question. Patent pending? Of the day. Well, patent pending. I like that. <laughs> the category is neural prosthetics. So prosthetics in the nervous system. So, yeah, that refers to devices that can substitute for a motor, sensory, or cognitive ability that might have been damaged as a result of an injury or a disease. The first such prosthetic was implanted onto and into a patient's head and connected via electrodes to a patient's nervous system in 1957. Whoa. Yes, so this is 65 years ago. As of today, over 200,000 such devices have been implanted of this first type. Question, what muscle, sensory, or cognitive, that's thinking ability, does this neural prosthetic assist? You're going to have to stick around to the end of the show for the answer. But after this break, we'll be back with the interview with Dr. Paul Camerata from Rome here on Dr. Doctor. We are in Rome today interviewing Dr. Paul Camerata. Paul gave a talk at a conference here at Rome about uh, medicine. Is it reparative or transformative. And he talked about functional neurosurgery. He's the head of neurosurgery at the University of Kansas Medical Center and gave a stellar talk yesterday. He's been on Dr. Doctor two previous times. Paul, welcome back to Dr. Doctor. Thank you so much, Tom. Just a pleasure to be here and see you again. So your talk touched on the subject of trans humanism. Now, I, I suppose transhumanism was seen in uh, the old Star Trek episodes with the Borg, which you might have seen. Uh, the more recent series, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., dealt with it in a, a more modern way. Is there really such a thing as transhumanism? And if so, what is it? Well, that's a really good question, uh, Tom. Today, we even heard a lecture from a, uh, a philosopher from France that said there is no transhumanist medicine, but uh, transhumanism is going beyond what is what it is to be human or post-human. And the easiest way to think of it, or at least what people are describing the word as, is is like you mentioned, a cyborg. It's sort of using uh, 
medicine or some brain computer interface, as it were, to add something to augment or repair, um, you know, the uh, the uh, human that is uh, that is suffering or that has a disease. Uh, nice way that a lot of people might uh, uh, know this or have seen this are people with ALS, for instance, who use, uh, now they use their eyes to uh, to communicate uh, by so looking at So an example of that would be Stephen Hawking, Stephen who's Hawking, been in the yeah. news a lot using his his eyes to communicate. Yes, and there, there are even now, a, there's a computer interface that allows people with ALS, now this is experimental, has been done, to uh, communicate via the interface that is placed in their brain. Just a little micro electrode array uh, that is placed over the, uh, the cortex and then it is uh, uh, connected via a, an interface to a computer. And so uh, uh, scientists have now done this in people with ALS, people who have had spinal cord injury and been quadriplegic. They connect, for instance, uh, if you need to restore movement, the uh, walking or the movement of an arm or hand, uh, you place this uh, tiny microelectrode in the brain on the part of the cortex that controls the hand or the arm, and then via wires and an interface connect it to a robotic arm, for instance. And so people have um, have been able to operate a robotic arm to attempt to feed themselves. The movements are rather crude at the moment, but researchers all over the world are working on uh, on improving this. And uh, so they've demonstrated that they can that they can do this literally just by by thinking. I need to move that robotic arm. They will. They will move, it. move the arm. You know, it reminds me, gosh, this movie came out 40 years ago. It's called Firefox with Clint Eastwood. It didn't do well on Rotten, Rotten Tomatoes, but as a kid, I loved it. And in it, he is supposed to steal the Soviet plane that can control weapons by thinking. And I remember he's in the plane and he needs to get off a second Firefox plane that's behind him. And he's thinking and nothing's happening. And then he realizes, oh, that's right. I have to think in Russian. And then it launches the <laughs> missile and, and destroys the other plane. That was kind of the, the end of the picture. Sorry for the spoiler. You probably weren't going to watch it I need to watch anyway. that. I need to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to go through your, you know, some of the things you talked about. So let's first talk about things that are definitely moral and ethical to do. You talked about functional neurosurgery for epilepsy. So what is epilepsy and what is functional neurosurgery for that treatment? Uh, epilepsy is uh, a disease where uh, a person will have multiple seizures and uh, seizures can really affect the quality of life as those of you afflicted with it might might know. And so in order to cure epilepsy, uh, surgeons have been working on this for now nearly a hundred years. Uh, they've tried to first cut out the part of the brain that uh, is causing the epilepsy. The brain works on electricity, and so if you have something in there that's scar tissue, tumor, or whatever, uh, it kind of short circuits. Is it usually a small area? Yes, very often a small area. How small? We're talking uh, pencil eraser? Uh, yes, a centimeter, maybe sometimes if it, in the case of a tumor, it could be much larger, sure. just several. But uh, you know, the, the medial temporal lobe in the area, there's something called the hippocampus, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, Greek for seahorse, and it's, it's where uh, memory is. And uh, that uh, structure is uh, relatively small, a few centimeters long and okay. a centimeter wide. And so we go in and remove that, Wow. And in, in many cases, people are cured of their epilepsy. Well, you know, we have moved uh, in, in some of these disorders from uh, ablative surgery or, you know, damage, taking out something to simply stimulating it uh, with a stimulator. And so in the case of epilepsy now, uh, we can place a where there are two types of, uh, uh, of uh, this uh, surgery that we do. One is implanting an electrode in the thalamus, which is a, a deep structure kind of relay station in the brain. And uh, we stimulate that uh, with a little uh, stimulator that's connected to a battery that's implanted uh, underneath in the supraclavicular area above the clavicle under the skin and controlled on and off with a magnet. And uh, it stimulates uh, to prevent seizures. There's also a closed loop system that we have, meaning that um, there's a device that we implant in the skull. Uh, the battery and the computer is in the skull. The electrodes go into the brain and sense before the seizure is going to occur. There are little, um, you know, uh, firings that the neurons have that uh, lead us to believe a seizure is coming. It senses that, and then the computer sends a little abortive uh, current into that area, which stops the seizure. It's an ingenious device. So the first thing you describe that's above the collarbone, that one is always sending out signals? Yes. 
whereas the other one is just as needed when it senses. How do you recharge that battery? Uh, you don't. Uh, you actually replace it after 10 years. The first, ah. the first uh, uh, iteration, we had to do it after five years. Now it's a battery that lasts literally 10 years. And you can, it's, it's unbelievable. You can uh, place a device up o over, the, uh, over the device on your skull, and the neurologist can read everything that has been captured by the computer in there, and talk, <laughs> like, like they do with heart arrhythmias. I was just now, wondering, yeah. yes, like uh, with the halter monitors that they do. So... Um, you posed yesterday in your talk that there might be an ethical question surrounding this implantation. While this is a noble thing for epilepsy to have literally an onboard computer, um, would it be ethical if it stored memories from the hippocampus? How, how would you address that? Yeah, that, that is a really good question. And that's kind of the purpose of this conference is we're here to, uh, to note what the current state is and what the future may hold and to pause you know, and think about uh, what is uh, ethically, uh, what is uh, what is ethical, what is possible, and what is ethical and moral, and and I would say, uh, you know, as long as we are healing, uh, repairing, um, uh, we're we're doing you know God's work. We're acting as physicians and as Christ as uh, as healers. When we start talking about augmenting. Uh, again, we have to we have to look at the reason. I mean, you, you mentioned cyborgs. There are, uh, you know, you can scan the internet. There are multiple uh, nations right now that have programs uh, to create, you know, the super, uh, the superhuman, the super soldier. As yes. It were. And um, you know, is that uh, is that legitimate? Is that moral? There, there you know, there's not. Uh, 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 there, there is certainly risk to doing some of this. And so, when you talk about uh, I'm going to open your skull and yes. put a device in there right. to uh, to make your memory better, to uh, to make you faster, stronger, you know, quicker intellect, uh, better memory. You know, I, I'm not I'm not sure that that is uh, where we need to focus. Well, our... so recently we did an episode looking on the ethics of cosmetic surgery procedures. So in some cosmetic surgery, the goal is to make somebody look better than they otherwise would look by nature. So how is this question neurosurgically similar or different than the cosmetic surgery question? Well, so you could say, uh, for instance, let's say, let's say that uh, a few years from now, we find that one of these augmentative procedures that helps your memory will cure someone with Alzheimer's disease or will help someone from becoming absolutely, you know, an invalid, crippled, mm -hmm. unable to communicate by stimulating their memory structures in their brain with a right. tiny device. I mean, we're, we are uh, keeping uh, the ravages of uh, time and age and this disease from, um, from affecting this person in the same way we're, we're treating cancer and keeping someone from dying of cancer. So in that sense, I would say that, uh, that, that it's different. So you have used what you call a BCI, brain-computer interface, in other conditions, such as quadriplegia. This has been a dream forever because in quadriplegia, the muscles still work or would work. They just don't have the electrical circuitry there. All right. Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. Um, uh, you need to look at, for instance, if someone has been... So, so right now what happens is, and I have some, someone uh, working in, in our lab that is doing this, he's implanting primates with the brain computer interface and controlling robotic arms. Uh, he's also uh, using, um, as I mentioned before, using the mind to move a cursor on the computer screen or create motions with the hand that uh, the monkey is presented with an image of the hand, you know, for instance, making an okay sign. And then he has a little avatar there and he thinks and makes the avatar make the okay sign. It's, it's amazing, amazing things. But it's a long way from that to running a robotic arm. Um, and the, the, the second part of it is, I'm not sure I want a robotic arm. I want my arm to work again. You know, so how, right. are you going to connect it to the muscles in the arm? And you know, if you've been quadriplegic for 20 years, those muscles are no longer there, or they they have atrophied to the point yes. that they're no longer usable. So there's a number of different roads that we'd have to go down. One, you create a you know a device that fits on the arm that acts like a robotic arm uh, to to reactivate uh, the limbs. Or you, you know, you clamp on an artificial limb. Uh, you know, I don't know if you'd have to amputate uh, the arm to do it, which is again a non-functional arm at this point. So these are, you know, these are all questions of where to go. And right now, we're we're still a ways from from all of that. And 
you know, what has been thought of is maybe you can reconnect the damage in the spinal cord. Is that even further away than what you're talking about with the implanted little computer? Yeah, so, you know, the spinal cord is one of those, uh, one of those parts of the body. We used to think that nerves never regenerate. They, right. they just, uh, they're, you're born with your set of nerves and uh, you can never, uh, never grow new ones. And, and to some extent that's still true, but there are researchers all over the, the, the country and the world that are working to still try and repair uh, the spine, the spinal cord. Um, and they have found that, you know, some things, if you can uh, keep the scar out of the area that uh, sometimes the, uh, you have to address it early, but sometimes the body will uh, will uh, begin to heal that area. Um, uh, others, uh, you, you may have read about. There's a, there was a project in uh, based in Louisville, Kentucky, where they uh, they used a spinal cord stimulator, mm -hmm. one that is normally used for uh, pain to okay. block pain impulses from getting to your brain, to stimulate a spine of someone who is paraplegic, and and actually recruit. Uh, new neural pathways so that these people were able to stand, walk, move their legs where they had no movement, zero movement before, uh, for years uh, before this was implanted. Now, were they stimulating it below the damage in the spinal cord? Yes. Yeah, they were stimulating below the damage in the spinal cord while they were doing uh, physical therapy. They had an intense physical therapy effort, hours of physical therapy every day, uh, sort of training, you know, the spinal cord and the neural circuits once again uh, to work. But they knew that it was an incomplete spinal injury. In other words, there was some sensory information still ah. getting to the brain, uh, and but no motor, no motor movement whatsoever. So, so was the the patient's uh, brain stimuli for those muscles active, or was it just active from this little stimulator placed on the spinal cord below the injury? You know, I don't know enough about it, uh, Tom, to speak intelligently. I think, but I, I think the patients were still able able to once af once they had gone through this year of okay. intense therapy and stimulation, able to control it with their brain. Yeah, uh, that is phenomenal. Now, you also mentioned yesterday that the brain computer interface can decode words and sentences from electrical activity. I mean, that sounds way science fiction. Tell yeah. us what that really means today. Well, so this was a, uh, uh, I believe the patient was a woman who had a, uh, a basilar artery occlusion and had suffered uh, from anarthria. So just couldn't get the words out. Mouth didn't didn't work. Okay. And uh, but her brain obviously is still able to think of yes. uh, words and to try and make her uh, her vocal cords and her mouth work to make words. Uh, and so what happened was uh, the researchers, I believe this was at San Francisco, um, they implanted an electrode array over the surface of the brain on the left side, which is where most of us have our speech centers, and were able to decode the, the signals so that uh, on a computer screen, when they would ask her a question, she would respond appropriately with the right words and, and everything. She, she could not talk. Her, right. her mouth did not move, but the, she spoke through the computer. That is just incredible so how big was this implantable device on the uh you know i have to remember i believe it was a few centimeters maybe uh three by five centimeters but don't quote me on that it was a grid array i believe that yes. sat on the on the surface of the brain because you showed us some pictures yesterday that were far smaller than a yes, dime those were implantable electrodes and floating electrodes that they they uh they implant actually directly within the cortex and they, they may have used implantable you know penetrating electrodes in this uh this one woman but i believe it was a surface uh, surface electrode we use those often now for uh, epileptic uh, monitoring for epilepsy surgery ah, okay so we'll take uh, somebody who has epilepsy we don't know where it's coming from we know the general vicinity on one side of the head and then we open the skull open the covering of the brain and then lay these electrodes on the brain and then wait a week or two and send the patients up to the hospital ward to the epilepsy unit and watch and let them have seizures and then we we can tell oh the seizures are originate from electrode number one or two ah. or five and then we go back and, and cut that area out if we can and when you yeah. let them have seizures are you doing something so they don't have the muscle actions or do you let no them they usually have the the full-blown seizures we'll we'll try and stop it as, as soon as it starts but usually they're very short acting anyway and so we'll uh, yeah the uh, we want them to have their uh, their typical seizures because those are the ones that we want to want to get rid of and so. a practical question for yeah. listeners if they see somebody having a seizure what should they do i mean you, you see in the old movies and putting something between their teeth should they do anything 
Yeah, so uh, that's a good good point. Uh, other than observe the patient, it's probably best to uh, to not do anything. Used to say, you know, uh, you don't want them to swallow their tongue, but now you don't want to stick your fingers in their mouth because you could be injured. Right. And uh, so, yeah, you you know, it's very it's rare that someone actually dies of an epileptic seizure. It does happen, and so you want to make sure that the uh, stay with them for a minute or two. Make sure they begin breathing normally again. And that they pink up. Uh, usually, usually, seizures are self-limited uh, after about uh, thirty to ninety seconds. Uh, but obviously, call nine one one. Do do people remember their seizures? Uh, often, people will remember just the beginning of their mm -hmm. seizures. Now, there are if it's a generalized seizure, they do lose consciousness. That's the definition. But there are focal seizures where someone will begin seizing in a hand or foot, for instance, ah. and it will just shake for a few minutes and then stop. Yes, they will remember those. And they're sure. typically incredibly tired afterwards. Yes, after the seizures, they're exhausted. Oftentimes, they're incontinent. They ah. lose their urine. Uh, they don't have control over that. Um, oftentimes, happens at night. Uh, oh, you know, when, they're so when they're sleeping. Yeah. We'll be right back with the rest of this episode of Doctor Doctor with Doctor Paul Camerata after this. Let's get back to our episode of Doctor Doctor with Doctor Paul Camerata talking about brain science and advances in technology. Now, you also mentioned that some of these uh, brain computer interface units can help a patient to even draw letters on a screen. Yes, yeah, unbelievable. Uh, again, it was in one of these uh, patients who had uh, uh, lost the ability to, to speak, and uh, they were able to uh, draw letters. I don't, I haven't read the article thoroughly enough to know exactly where the uh, the implant was placed. But uh, uh, it's a, it's really a, it just came out last year. It's a striking uh, striking article when you see on a computer these letters being drawn. You know, A B C. They could spell words. You know, it got up to uh, with training. This person uh, got to I think eighty words or eighty uh, letters a minute. So uh, it has the potential certainly to. Uh, you know, to be something very useful in the future. You know, I wonder how fast the system Stephen Hawking uh, uses yeah. works and if he has looked into any of these. Yeah, no, I'm sure he, he had, uh, you know, when, when uh, you know, had probably had the best, uh, the, the best technology available uh, when, he was, uh, when he was alive. But, uh, yeah, he was using, I believe he was using the... Uh, the ocular version right. to speak. Uh, I don't think anyone implanted anything in him uh, at the time. But no, I'm not I think sure. you're right yeah. about that. Another thing you talked about was deep brain stimulation. And you know, when I operate on a skin cancer in somebody's head, I often have to stay away from that because there's something underneath the skin there. What are those deep brain stimulators? So uh, deep brain stimulation is now used uh, to treat a number of disorders. Um, epilepsy is one of them. We talked about putting an electrode into the thalamus. Uh, we go to the subthalamus and to the uh, globus pallidus for Parkinson's disease. This is we drill a small, you know, uh, hole maybe a few millimeters in diameter uh, on each side of the head. We implant an electrode that goes very deep into a very highly specific uh, area of the brain uh, that is literally a millimeter or two. If you're off one side or the other. Uh, it doesn't work, wow. uh, and the devices have little. Uh, uh, the, the devices are constantly, uh, you know, improving every every year. They have a number of electrodes on them, and they can stimulate in a directional fashion, forward, backwards, one side or the other, and uh, they're connected to uh, a um, a pulse generator that again is uh, kept here uh, above the clavicle, under the skin, and a battery, and uh, again the person could turn it on or off. They're, they're pretty, I, I would encourage your listeners to maybe take a look at some YouTube videos of patients with tremor, for instance, where the electrode is put into the thalamus. And uh, the tremor can be, you know, just disabling. People can't yes. drink, they can't eat soup, they can't drink beer, they, they you know, drink with a straw, drink beer with a straw, uh, <laughs> they can't play golf. And there are these, you know, amazing, um, amazing pictures of, you know, what the person is like with the stimulator off. They turn it off with their magnet. They try and put a golf ball on a tee and they're moving and they just can't get it. And then they turn it on, they put the ball right on the tee and hit the shot. Or they can't eat soup, they're getting it all over themselves with the spoon shaking and then they turn their stimulator on, the tremor's gone. You showed us some tremendous videos yesterday. What would you recommend listeners search to find it? Tremor and what other terms? 
Uh, I would say uh, tremor, deep brain stimulation, Parkinson's disease, and uh, or or essential tremor, and then video. And uh, the the other uh, really innovative uh, uh, you know type of surgery we're doing now is this focused ultrasound, which is really oh that was incredible. Well, yeah. before you get to the non incisional sure. treatment. When you place these little electrodes, are you having to go through otherwise healthy brain tissue yes, with that? Yes, you do. And so, you know, it's a, uh, there is a, a slight risk because sure. uh, we're doing this through a very small hole in the skull. We're placing a, you know, a two millimeter wide electrode down, which is soft and uh, blunt. But nevertheless, on rare occasion, you can encounter a blood vessel. And of course, you're not going to see it. So you could get bleeding, infection. You know, those are the kind of risks of implanting this. And because of that, some people, there are a lot of people out there who, who have these diseases who really don't want the surgery because they don't want the risk of bleeding and infection that accompanies uh, an implantable device like that. Well, thus this next procedure yeah. with ultrasound. Explain it. This sounds really Star Trek-ish. Yeah, that's right. So this is a, a procedure called uh, MR-guided focused ultrasound. And it was developed in large part at uh, the University of Virginia uh, uh, for many years by a, a neurosurgeon, Jeff Elias, and, and colleagues. And um, what it does is it has a number of ultrasound transducers. So ultrasound is a sound wave, basically. Sure. Uh, the basis for, you know, Doppler and uh, listening to your carotid arteries or, or seeing, the baby in the womb. seeing the baby in the womb, all of that. So this is a, it, it has over a thousand ultrasound transducers that are uh, sending out a, uh, a beam uh, for lack of a better word, of ultrasound. So it's coming from multiple different directions around the All skull. All over the skull. Yeah, it's yep. like a sphere or a hemisphere of ultrasound transducers <laughs> sending that little sound wave through the skull, through the brain, to a tiny, tiny little area uh, deep in the brain uh, to basically heat it up until that part of the brain dies. And so you're making a lesion, but you're making the lesion uh, with uh, without an incision, just with ultrasound. And uh, the, the fascinating thing that has made this uh, uh, possible in the last few years has been the development of a technology called um, uh, MR thermography. So that's a thing where they can do an MR of the brain, MRI, the standard MRI the that everyone has. Imaging, magnetic resonance imaging. Magnetic resonance imaging. You get that of the brain. And we are able to tell literally every five seconds what the temperature of this small little bit of brain is. And so we're monitoring that temperature so we know, wait a minute, and, and so it's again, it's very precise. The patient's head is put in a frame, a rigid frame that actually we screw uh, four little screws under local anesthesia into the skull so the head can't move. But you don't have to go to sleep, it's not uncomfortable. Um, uh, you turn on the uh, device, the surgeon takes a look at the MRI and says, oh, this area is heating up, we're maybe one millimeter off, we need to move it, so he'll stop. Uh, maybe make a few adjustments in the device. And uh, and then when you get the right area, you know because the person's shaking and it <sighs> stops shaking. And, and then you, you don't, you don't uh, heat it up to, to kill it. And you wait, the tremor comes back. You go, okay, that was the right area. We're going to go ahead and oh, make the final lesion. Have you so witnessed this? I have, yes. It's, it's really incredible. People can't write their name. you know. And then immediately after this, they're able to write nearly perfectly. It's a that very durable treatment. That is stunning. So what Parkinson's patients are eligible for this? So right now, uh, Parkinson's patients who have a, what's called a tremor-predominant Parkinsonism, where they have a... a, a pretty good tremor. Instead of just uh, that little pill rolling one. Right. Where, yeah. Yes. Uh, and then patients with essential tremor. It was first approved for uh, for that uh, diagnosis. And that's a, actually a relatively common, everyone probably knows a relative or friend that has a little bit of a tremor. And this affects a lot of times it's familial. Uh, you'll see people at, uh, you know, that are 40 years old and just uh, shaking and uh, it really affects their, uh, their life. Why is it called essential? Uh, to differentiate it, I think, from the other types of tremor, there's a cerebellar tremor and a Parkinsonian tremor. And so they, uh, for some reason, they came up with the word essential tremor. Now, is years that the ago. one that as you reach for something, it gets worse? Uh, correct. Yes. And, uh, and that could also be cerebellar tremor, whereas, as you know, Parkinson's is the resting tremor, the yes. pill rolling tremor. So they're, they're also is, uh, they're examining different targets uh, now in the brain, uh, researching uh, 
Parkinsonism and trying to expand the indications of this into treating other types of Parkinson's disease. I've also seen patients with uh, chronic pain treated with this where oh. a lesion was made in a certain area in the brain called the cingulate gyrus that... Uh, uh, you know, somebody who, is, who had horrible pain gets right off the MR table and says, I, I have no pain anymore. Oh, it's miraculous. Wow. So it's uh, really an, an incredible technology. And, and there are a lot of other people, those who will not submit to any type of, you know, skin incision and implantable brain device who would, would do acquiesce that. to this type of treatment. Yes. So in, in the pain scenario, is that because the brain is sending out the pain signal or there is something distal to that something else in the body that is relaying a signal to the brain but now you're just not feeling it yeah it's it's more the latter although it's not so much uh, you're feeling the pain it's the the anxiety and the suffering part of the brain that is affected and so Ooh. the uh, you know the 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 generator of the pain obviously is is still there let's say this person had horrible back pain yes um you know or uh, uh, chronic pain in an extremity or something and uh, uh you know that obviously you haven't done anything by lesioning the brain but you're and, and you're not really lesioning even the relay station for all those pain fibers because pain is one of those things that's kind of nebulous there yes. aren't you know really good uh, well-defined you know, areas well-defined areas and so uh what they've done is they treat the uh the area of uh, sort of anxiety and uh, and suffering part of the brain to make that uh, make a lesion there. Uh, yesterday, when you were starting to talk about the future of this, uh, you, you talked about you can use the femoral vein in the groin and go up and implant something through the sagittal sinus, a, a big vein in the uh, adjacent to the brain. But doesn't the electrode have to actually get onto the gray matter itself? Yeah, so that's a really good question, and I don't know that they have published uh, their results, uh, uh, their detailed enough results to know how this happened. But what they, what they did is, and you're right, they did not get it right onto the cortex. They put it up through the vein into the sagittal sinus, and uh, I believe they parked it in the sinus. I don't think they put it into a vein or anything like that on one side of the sinus. Sure. And so uh, that the part of the brain that is the closest to the sagittal sinus is the part that controls the lower extremities. Okay. Remember the homunculus that yes. uh, lays over the side of the face and hand is here and the, the uh, feet and legs are up at the top. And so they were able to, uh, this was one of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, AI, uh, BCI uh, companies. I, I can't remember whether it was Synchron or I uh, can't remember the name of the exact company. I, sh I shouldn't say that. But at any rate, they, they were able to literally, again, without an incision, just going up through the venous system, park this electrode adjacent to, but not directly on the cortex. And it still had a benefit for the patient. Yes. That is amazing. Uh, you also mentioned this incredible study in rats that were blinded and yet they put in they implanted something that allowed them to sense what was it infrared yes it was essentially a different sensory modality i mean you know we have what five senses well these were rats that were made blind artificially and then uh they implanted a uh, uh a uh, infrared uh, sense essentially an and the rats sense. and the rats were able to navigate uh, their environment mazes uh, using the infrared sense that they have. So does this then activate, what is it, the occipital cortex yes. at the back of the brain is our visual sensing area. So was something going on there that they were receiving messages? Uh, yes. There, uh, so uh, the, there are also these, these um, uh, experiments going on in, in humans. Uh, one of my good friends in, in neurosurgery has for years been working on uh, sort of a, an ocular prosthesis, as it were. He's an epilepsy surgeon and, a, and an incredible researcher. His name's Dan Yoshore at uh, Penn, University of Pennsylvania. And he has, uh, has uh, implanted grid electrode arrays in people who are undergoing epilepsy surgery anyway. So he's there ah. uh, and putting these on and, and learning uh, while they're monitoring the epilepsy uh, seizures. He's learning the uh, anatomical uh, and neurophysiologic uh, precepts of that part of the brain, and then working on an animal model to basically uh, do just that. So in, in other words, what we're talking about is someone who's, uh, whose eye no longer works for some reason. Yes. The occipital lobe is fine. Right. The eye is not. And so you can imagine someone walking around 
blind yes. who's wearing glasses and there's something in the glasses that transmits back to that right. part of the brain what the environment looks like and they can they can quote see again or navigate and they, they've gotten pretty sophisticated in their stimulating uh, patients who are having epilepsy where they're monitoring them anyway yes. they they're able to to sense you know light dark movement things like that uh, already they've, they've figured that out and that's putting it directly on the cortex correct right. okay uh, but this is where it comes into the ethical issue of, wow, night vision goggles. That's right. Night vision brain, brain machine interface. Yeah. Uh, you know, should we be doing something like that? And, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and for what end? You know, again, the, the, uh, I, I dare say that probably uh, the defense industry in, in various nations is spending, you know, millions of dollars researching this in secret. <laughs> they probably are. I wouldn't be yeah. surprised, and probably not only Americans. Um, you mentioned Elon Musk in your talk yesterday. Uh, how did he come into this topic? So Elon Musk uh, has talked a lot about transhumanism, and uh, you know, I think in a debate once I mentioned he uh, he talked about uh, the fact that he thought AI was so good that uh, you know computers were going to. Uh, you know, reach a state of, of uh, I don't want to quote him because I don't have the actual words in front of me, but that computers were doing so well, AI was doing so well that they're going to surpass, you know, the ability of humans to, uh, to uh, think uh, in certain ways and to compute, etc. And so because of that, we need to stay ahead of the game, as it were, you know, as humans. And so we need to, we need to begin, uh, you know, with uh, uh, these sort of brain computer interfaces to explore that. And so he founded a company called Neuralink, uh, which uh, is investigating just that. They have a website. You can look and see the kinds of things they're, they're researching and looking on and all of the kind of people they're looking for in their company. And you, you go there and you could, I was looking at it the other day, just the, you know, it's like a job search. We need <laughs> neurosurgical technicians. We need, and, and a, and a colleague that I that I knew uh, in Kansas City a few years ago that I met in Kansas City, we touched base a year or two ago and said, "Well, what are you doing now?" He says, "I'm, I'm working for Neuralink." Wow, so a neurosurgeon <laughs> working for Elon Musk. Oh my go goodness, this, this reminds me of uh, working with the Delta Force guys in the military. This seems uh, to be similar. And, and Elon Musk spoke about something he called the singularity. Singularity, I've always heard referring to black holes. But he talks about a singularity where uh, artificial intelligence overcomes human intelligence. Is that possible? Are they measuring the same thing or is it uh, an aspect of intelligence? You know, that's a good question. That's a kind of philosophical thing that, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I think you, you can't surpass humanity. I mean, no matter what, we have, we have emotion, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, reason, you know, to think that a computer uh, uh, could... Uh, could be able to acquire those uh, those attributes. I just think uh, I think Elon believes yes, and I would certainly weigh in on the other side. Yes, and uh, I don't know if it was him or someone else you quoted saying that we are already cyborgs. That was him. Yeah, he said that. He said we are already cyborgs. He said, you know, we have a phone. What, where would you be without your phone? It's like you know, if the grid went down. Where, what would happen? Society would fall apart. Uh, people so, would become more normal. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, you know, we, we need holidays from uh, from these things, from our phones, etc. Uh, yeah, it reminds me of um, Peter Kraft, who you may know, the philosophy professor, author from uh, Boston College. He gives students extra credit if they will write a paper called "What I Did During the 24 Hours My Smartphone Was Turned Off." <laughs> and very few students took him up to on do it. it. Isn't that even amazing? though it's free? Wow. Yes, yes, just just amazing. Um, you also um, mentioned a talk you heard today on how uh, there was a researcher or a speaker here who said that there is no such thing as transhumanism. Yes, yeah, and uh, he was speaking in French, and I had the the translator on, so I didn't uh, I didn't understand uh, uh, all of it, but. Uh, you know, I think he was trying to make the case that, uh, you know, there is no such thing as transhumanism. We cannot go beyond humanity. You, you simply have a human with devices attached to them. It's not, it's not a transhuman or beyond or, or better humanity, as it were. If one of our listeners wants to learn more about these discussions, where can they go? 
Well, that's a good question. I would say if you search transhumanism, uh, a lot of things will come up. There's a, a surgeon, a neurosurgeon, uh, an acquaintance of mine from when I was young named Nayef Al-Rodan, who writes a lot on this, and he writes uh, very intelligent and in a way that many people can understand, that uh, lay people who really have no um, uh, scientific background. So I would, I would uh, search his name and transhumanism. And, uh, you know, just be, uh, be cautious about, uh, about what you're reading. And, uh, you know, the Catholic Medical Association uh, should have uh, links. The National Catholic Bioethics Center is, uh, is an incredible resource as well. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned one thing that might be possible is even helping behavior problems like or depression. Or anxiety. Yeah. yeah, so the, there has been um, deep brain stimulation tried um, sorry. Uh, on a number of occasions, actually in a couple of very well-known uh, large randomized trials. Uh, one was uh, somewhat positive, the other negative. In other words, uh, no, no effect. But uh, the thought is that we just haven't figured out the exact spot to put the electrode yet. And so these are people with chronic disabling you know, horrible depression. Can we implant a device that would be, you know, similar to a pill, you know, right. where we would, uh, where we'd be able to treat their depression. And right now we don't have that, that target exactly figured out, but I suspect within the next, you know, five years or so, uh, we'll be able to do what that. Th what that reminded me of was something we want to avoid was uh, the rats where they implanted something into the pleasure center and they kept stimulating it and they would press a button to stimulate it and the rats would press a button until they starved to death. Yes, till they died, yeah. So, I mean, this is, these are the things we have to think about. Yes, curing depression is a great thing, but could you say, well, I, I want a, uh, I want a, you know, I don't know if you'd call him a cosmetic neurosurgeon or somebody, you know, <laughs> to, to like put something into my pleasure center and, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, I want to live with, with that. So, I mean, it's, uh, uh, the future is, uh, is frightening in that respect. So what final words do you have for our listeners on this um, scary and possibly life enhancing topic? Uh, I would just uh, ask them to, uh, you know, to think about it, uh, to be prepared that uh, someone they know or love uh, might benefit from uh, the reparative uh, uh, and healing sort of uh, procedures that we're now doing with uh, brain computer interfaces, uh, with uh, deep brain stimulation, etc. And that in the future, uh, we need to, again, be cautious, take pause, think about what is, uh, what is moral and just and, uh, versus what we can do. Dr. Paul Camerata, thanks for being with us on Dr. Doctor again today. Tom, a pleasure to be with you. Thanks. And Tom, we are back with the medical trivia question here on Dr. Doctor. Tell us about neural prosthetics, Tom. So the question is, what was the first neural prosthetic implanted into a patient's nervous system in 1947? And as of today, over 200,000 such devices have been implanted. So the question, what muscle, sensory, or thinking ability does it assist? And if you were listening to Andrew as he pontificated in the first section, you heard the answer. Now people can tell when I read the scripts and when I don't. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so the answer to the question is what ability? The ability is hearing. So it's the cochlear implant. So I suppose Andrew did say cochlear implant. He didn't say hearing. So you had to know that cochlear implants assisted hearing. That's yeah, right. It, it's implanted onto the skull, under the skin to take the place of an eardrum and the stapes bone, which creates vibration on the eardrum. So it uses an electrode to bypass the eardrum and the middle ear and directly is implanted onto the auditory nerve, which then takes the signal to the auditory cortex in the brain. That's pretty cool. Yeah, this is definitely a very interesting thing. You know, for my, my top three, you, you guys touched on so many things in the interview. I guess I, I always think about the philosophical and, and the ethical aspects. So number one for me is the difference between healing or repairing something that's abnormal or damaged mm -hmm. versus augmenting yes. you know could this lead to night vision or the cyborg you know jason yeah. Bourne warriors i mean it's super just like cool those movies yes but uh <laughs> at the same time probably not ethical at that point when we're but trying you know to what augment. getting up in the middle of the night to find your way to the bathroom there'd be a lot less stub toe injuries wouldn't there that's true <laughs> that's probably true. not enough on the ethical scale to that's true there's a moral. there's definitely an analysis <laughs> there but that's i mean that's the fundamental thing we want to go back to are we trying to heal or repair yep. versus improve on on god's design um 
number two, I would say for me is just the, the what and the how the idea of a brain computer interface or the deep brain stimulators that they already have for Parkinsonism. Um, when, when you guys introduced this idea of transhumanism, I wasn't familiar with the term, ah. uh, tell you the truth. I mean, it kind of, kind of says what it means, but it could mean a lot of things. What it means <laughs> is basically the computer being implanted for the most part, somehow into your body and using electricity to manipulate the body. So that's my number two, kind of a practical one. And then number three uh, was this idea of cosmetic neurosurgery. <laughs> and really, the, so, so much of medicine is derived out of the academic institutions and hospitals yes. and universities and whatnot. But now, as you introduced, even Elon Musk has a company, a, yes. a for-profit company, who's hiring neurosurgeons and exploring this. And uh, while there's definitely scientific benefit, there's a profit motive. And this whole idea of cosmetic surgery, what could you do to become part cyborg and, and bigger, faster, stronger? Uh, so kind of scary, kind of surreal, uh, definitely something to think about. And I'm sure that we were going to be, we're going to be talking about this more in the future as we see this stuff come to be, you know, that's a great summary, Andrew. And we thank our listeners for bearing with us through yet another episode, which I think was incredibly fascinating, hopefully unexpected to you and surprising in both good and thoughtful ways. Uh, you can find this in all old episodes on our website, drdoctor.org. Just click on episode archive at the top where you can search by topic or guest. And now we even offer a video version of our podcast. Just click on the YouTube link near the top of the homepage at drdoctor.org. And if you have a question or an idea of an episode topic, go ahead and send it in where it says submit a question. This is Dr. Tom McGovern and Dr. Andrew Mullally, and we're signing off until your next dose of Dr. Doctor. The views expressed on Dr. Doctor do not necessarily represent those of your co-host. Have a question for our doctors or a topic you'd like to hear about? Call or text your questions to the Holy Cross College text line at 260-436-9598 or fill out the form at drdoctor.org. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Dr. Doctor Show and tune in for new episodes every Friday. Plus, find all our past episodes at drdoctor.org.